But of course, our main focus today is on our distinguished speaker, Justice Michael Kirby. It's such an honor to have him at the law school. He has a fantastic, distinguished career uh, in Australia and around the world in promoting human rights. Uh, first of all, he was a distinguished judge in Australia, twice serving as the active, acting chief of the High Court of Australia, uh, the longest serving justice in, Australian history, in Australia's history on that court. And during that period, a very active leader on the subject of LGBT rights, a prominent uh, LGBT figure in Australian public life who inspired many in Australia and around the world through his leadership in various international organizations devoted to that issue. In addition to that, he has an extremely distinguished career uh, working with the United Nations in various capacities. He was the special representative of the Secretary General in Phnom Penh in Cambodia during the period when uh, the United Nations was running Cambodia in the early 1990s. Later, he was the chair of the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights Violations in North Korea, which is what we will hear about today. And most recently, he is serving on the Secretary General's high-level panel on access to medicines. And indeed, he has been meeting with various uh, members of the university community on that issue over the last two days. We've been very uh, honored to have him here and very eager to hear what he has to say today on his lecture um, on North Korea. The topic of his, of his talk is um, our dilemma, North Korean art dilemma. Without any further ado, Justice Michael Kirk. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ginsburg, and um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along to this talk <coughs> on the work of the Commission of Inquiry on uh, North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, I want to start by paying my respects to the uh, very distinguished law school of the University of Chicago. This is my third visit to uh, this law school. And uh, on the last occasion I was here, I was in the presence of um, Justice Albie Sachs uh, of South Africa and Justice Yacoub of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Uh, and uh, the whole place was covered with snow. So to be here today on this beautiful sunny day uh, and to have the opportunity during the day to uh, have a little mini tour of uh, Chicago on the way to a radio broadcast was a, a very great pleasure. <coughs> uh, I also want to pay respects to the Schwartz family, uh, Ulysses S. Schwartz and his wife Marguerite, uh, who are the persons uh, in whose name this uh, lecture series has been uh, founded. Um, were, uh, he was a distinguished uh, lawyer and judge. He was not himself blessed by being an alumnus of the University of Chicago, but of the John Marshall School. Uh, but that was only because of uh, his uh, age. Uh, I'm sure he would have come here if it had been founded in time. But his son, John, uh, attended uh, the school. Uh, uh, Ulysses S. Schwartz became a justice of the uh, Supreme Court of Illinois, uh, and John became a judge of the Federal Bankruptcy Court, uh, and uh, this lecture fund was established for us to reflect upon and think about the career of um, Ulysses X. S. Schwartz, who was, uh, as I was, a judge uh, of a state Supreme Court uh, and uh, a distinguished, uh, he was a distinguished lawyer who contributed to the uh, rule of law in this country. Now, um, I am here to talk about the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea. Uh, this is the report that we produced. You'll see it was about, um, about uh, 400 pages in length. Uh, and it's a great pity that the United Nations wasn't more capable in getting 
reports of this kind out into the uh, marketplace of ideas. It would be a good thing if anybody in the audience knows a ready publisher who will publish the report uh, in a way that it will be available in every airport near you because <laughs> even if I say so myself, taking responsibility for every word in the report, uh, it is readable. It's a page turner uh, to see what is happening in our world in North Korea is a real eye-opener and it's very important because of the dangers that it presents to itself and to its neighbours that we should all be aware of it. Uh, North Korea has been in the news uh, even in recent days. Um, since the report uh, of the Commission of Inquiry was delivered to the United Nations, uh, the report was received by the Human Rights Council uh, in March of 2014. Uh, it then went to the Third Committee of the General Assembly and ultimately to the General Assembly uh, later in 2013. Uh, and in December uh, 2014, it went to the Security Council, uh, which is an unusual thing in the case of a report on human rights. It's rare that such matters go up to the Security Council, but it was done in this case, I think, because of the um, uh, astonishment and distress that the international community felt about the matters that were reported uh, in the pages of the report. Uh, and uh, last December 2015, um, with the facilitation of uh, ambassador Samantha Powers, the uh, United States ambassador to the United Nations. The report went back to the Security Council uh, and um, was the subject uh, of debate and as Ambassador Power pointed out, uh, it is now on the seizure list of the Security Council and the matters that are happening in North Korea relevant to human rights and to other matters can be brought up to the Council for consideration uh, virtually on a moment's notice. And that's a very good thing, that the Council has the matter under its scrutiny. That proved quite important uh, when um, in uh, January of this year the uh, DPRK conducted its fourth nuclear test. Uh, it asserted that it was it had tested a hydrogen bomb. Uh, many observers uh, studying the um, reports and the scientific data doubt that, but whether it was a larger uh, atomic bomb or a hydrogen bomb matters little really. It was a very dangerous weapon uh, and it was uh, tested uh, the fourth time North Korea had done that. As well, a month later, uh, it uh, sent a, a satellite into space, but very few were deceived into thinking that this was because of a great interest on the part of North Korea in uh, satellites. Uh, this was uh, a test of their rocket missile technology, <coughs> and uh, that is the, the source of deep concern. So deep was that concern that within days, on the 29th uh, of February, uh, the uh, Security Council for the third time took the issues of North Korea back onto its agenda and the Security Council uh, adopted unanimously um, very strict new sanctions which were imposed on uh, North Korea. And uh, according to the reports that are available to us, it does appear that those sanctions are being enforced, including by China. So that we have come to the point that the Security Council has acted in a substantive way in respect of uh, the uh, situation in North Korea, and in particular its uh, military posture, and that is also a good thing that the Security Council is taking the situation uh, into its uh, concerns. Now, 
the Commission of Inquiry was established after a lot of reports of very grave wrongs that were happening in uh, North Korea. Uh, and um, I had no previous immediate experience with North Korea. Uh, as uh, Professor Ginsberg has said, I did have an experience in the 1990s, 93 to 96, as Special Representative of Secretary General Boutros Ghali um, for human rights in Cambodia. But North Korea was outside my immediate area of expertise. And therefore, uh, when I was uh, contacted, actually at a conference in England, and asked if I would be agreeable to my name going forward for appointment to chair the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea, I could approach the matter with a uh, complete open mind. I had no animus uh, or uh, feelings of hostility to North Korea. Uh, all that I knew of North Korea was what a reasonably well-informed reader of The Economist newspaper and other uh, such sources would know about uh, this unusual country. Uh, the other two members of the commission who were appointed were Sonia Biserko, who was an expert in uh, genocide uh, law in uh, Serbia, she's a national of Serbia, uh, and Marzuki Durasman, who was the special rapporteur of the Human Rights Council on North Korea. Um, he was ex officio uh, a member of the Commission of Inquiry, and we three constituted the commission. Uh, we met for the first time on the 1st of July, uh, 2013, uh, and we had until um, March 2014 within which to produce our report. And we brought the report into uh, the Council of the, uh, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations within uh, the period specified. It was released in February uh, 2014. Uh, and it was tabled in the Human Rights Council uh, in March 2014. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that it caused great consternation in the Council because the report addressed the nine-point mandate that had been given to us by uh, the Council. We looked, for example, at the issue of political control of the population uh, in uh, North Korea. The way in which media are totally controlled, uh, the access to the internet is uh, forbidden. Uh, it's available only to a very small elite. There is now an intranet within North Korea um, which has itself proved very useful in spreading information uh, around the country, but access to the internet uh, is unavailable unless you can uh, secure um, uh, means uh, in various ways that experiments uh, in North Korea have sometimes permitted. But generally speaking, the people are under very strict uh, psychological and political control. Uh, movement within the country uh, is very strictly controlled. You can't leave the district uh, in which you are registered without the permission of a local official. Uh, the country uh, is uh, governed according to a, a type of modified command economy uh, and uh, that has proved most inefficient in providing food to the population and in particular after a famine struck the country in the mid-1990s, uh, a very large number of the citizens perished in the famine. The exact number is a matter of uh, conjecture because access to this kind of data is not easy but uh, it's generally believed that something of the order of at least 400,000 uh, of the citizens of North Korea died and 
many say it's more than a million died in a population of 24 million, that's a very large proportion of the country. As well as that, uh, United Nations um, uh, information uh, indicates that there are very high levels of stunting amongst the children uh, in the country because uh, they have been deprived of the necessary nourishment during childhood and this has led to uh, um, the, the um, interference with brain development during those critical first years of life. Um, but in addition to these uh, human rights wrongs, great human rights wrongs, uh, the uh, evidence that came before the Commission in the form of testimony from uh, the witnesses who gave us evidence was uh, of uh, the interference in uh, practice of religion in North Korea, uh, any ideology or philosophy that is different from that of the um, ruling party and regime is, is very strictly watched and discouraged. Uh, the Christian affirming population of North Korea at the time of partition uh, in 1945 was roughly the same as in South Korea, about 24% of the population. Now it's less than 1% of the population and that is on figures provided by uh, the um, government of North Korea itself. Uh, and uh, they say that there is freedom of religion but the figures seem to indicate that if that's so, it's so only in the language of their constitution and not in practice. Uh, there was gr a great deal of evidence about the, the persecution of uh, Koreans who had fled uh, the country, particularly during the famine, to get into China uh, and uh, that the, the special persecution of women, uh, the effective trafficking of women uh, when they uh, went into China for the purpose of survival uh, and uh, the severe punishment if they were discovered on their return to North Korea to have had any contact with agents of South Korea, the Republic of Korea. Uh, so all of these, uh, these testimonies uh, that came before us in our public hearings painted a picture which uh, was one of a country that for a very long time has been oppressing its population uh, and uh, uh, breaching the international law of human rights. Uh, and therefore the uh, question that was posed for the Commission of Inquiry on the basis of the evidence that we had was did any of this evidence rise to the level of genocide? Did any of this evidence rise to the level of crimes against humanity? Genocide is defined in the Genocide Convention as being acts of violence as a matter of state policy directed at a population or part of a population for reasons of race, nationality, uh, ethnicity or religion. And in the end, we couldn't say that the persecution of people in North Korea was based upon any of those grounds. Uh, fundamentally, uh, it was based upon uh, the disorganisation of the economy and the failure to provide for the food of the population, a primary obligation of government, uh, whilst they pursued uh, expensive uh, nuclear and other armament uh, uh, endeavours, uh, but fundamentally it was based upon the so-called Songban system, which is a system that was instituted in North Korea by the founder uh, and which classifies people according to their loyalty to the regime. There are in fact 55 sub-classifications, but the basic three classifications are of the core class who are regarded as loyal to the regime, uh, the wavering class who are regarded as untrustworthy 
and the hostile class who are regarded as positively opposed to the regime and if you're in the hostile class your children are in the hostile class and it's very difficult to escape from the hostile class and generally you lose out on all of the advancements in education, housing and employment and you often end up in the uh, mines in the northeast of the country uh, or in other uh, inhospitable parts of uh, a generally inhospitable terrain. And so this was the land we found and I think it's important very briefly to tell you that we went about finding it in a way that is not the way the UN normally operates. The UN normally operates in a fashion which is similar to the uh, fashion of the civil law tradition because most of the world is run according to the civil, civilian uh, uh, methodology of gathering information and deciding disputed facts. Uh, we didn't do it that way. That, that way has advantages. It's cheap uh, and it's efficient uh, and uh, it's, it can be quite effective but it's pretty secretive. Uh, and we decided that we would go about our inquiry in the manner of the Anglo-American legal system. And so we had public hearings, we had media present during the public hearings, uh, we had transcript which was put up online, we put all our witnesses who it was safe to put online uh, and with their consent and with our decision uh, on the internet so that when as was inevitably going to happen. We were attacked by North Korea for having chosen people who were enemies of the fatherland. We could say, well, have a look for yourself. See these people and judge for yourself whether or not uh, they were trustworthy. The methodology of the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea was a very important step. And in Geneva now, uh, this is generally regarded as the gold standard of UN inquiries. And I think we're going to see more inquiries of the United Nations done in this open, transparent way. Often the best antidote to the oppressors of human rights is to act in a way that is manifestly fair to them, that observes due process even to them, but that is transparent and that puts the matter out in the public domain so that the citizens of the world can see it. Looking back on our inquiry, I think I can say that even if nothing came of it, nothing at all, the fact that the people who came to us uh, were honoured to be uh, accepted and to express their uh, evidence and their suffering before uh, the international community, that that itself, that the United Nations made that facility available, was itself a very important way of dealing with the secretive and oppressive and totalitarian regime of North Korea. Now all of this came into the Council on Human Rights and into the General Assembly through the Third Committee uh, and then to the Security Council. Uh, and uh, I think it was the power of the report that got the Security Council interested in the matter. But as we all know, resolutions of the uh, Council on Human Rights and of the General Assembly and of the Security Council, even big resolutions with strong votes, which is what all these resolutions were, don't actually change the human rights of a single individual who's affected by them. And therefore, the question is what can we do uh, to secure action on the recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry? We made a number of recommendations which uh, have already been implemented. One of them was that a, that, a f that a field office should be established in the region, we hoped uh, in the Republic of Korea, in South Korea, although that's a sensitive matter in itself <coughs> and it wasn't certain that the Republic of Korea would agree. But eventually they did, and so a field office has been set up in Seoul, which is continuing the work of the Commission of Inquiry. It's continuing to gather the data and uh, effectively to gather the testimony. Indeed, taking up uh, our own methodology and a suggestion of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
Prince Zaid of, of Jordan. Uh, it's taking it up in the form of depositions which could one day be placed before a tribunal that was looking at the guilt or, or otherwise of those who are the subject of the statements by the witnesses. Um, and uh, other recommendations uh, are contained at the conclusion of our reports. The report is full of findings which we make concerning the uh, wrongdoing, uh, findings of crimes against humanity, though not of genocide, uh, and uh, recommendations are made of the steps that could be taken to implement the report. A specific recommendation was that uh, accountability had to be asserted in respect of those who were responsible for the crimes against humanity that we reported. A crime against humanity uh, is by definition a crime involving violence uh, against uh, individuals or group of individuals as a matter of state policy uh, and uh, of a kind that shocks the conscience of humanity. And therefore, by definition, a crime against humanity demands that there should be a response, there should be an action, uh, and that is what we recommended. We went through the possibilities of action. We, we um, considered whether it would be enough that a prosecutor should be appointed uh, awaiting a subsequent tribunal, either within Korea itself or within the international community, but without specifying a particular court. But the problem with that is that until you know the court, it's more difficult to identify exactly what the evidence will be appropriate to the jurisdiction of that court, and therefore that was a less than favoured uh, proposal. Another proposal was for a special tribunal, like the tribunal on the former Yugoslavia or Rwanda, but uh, those tribunals, though they have had some effectiveness, as we've seen even within recent days, with the conviction of uh, Karavich uh, in the Yugoslavia tribunal, uh, they are extremely expensive, rather slow, and therefore we didn't think that that was an idea that uh, the United Nations would accept. But the most suitable uh, tribunal, we thought, was the International Criminal Court. But the problem is that North Korea is not itself a party to the Rome Statute setting up the International Criminal Court. And therefore, we had to look to the special provision in the Rome Statute by which there is an exceptional case um, if a party is not a, uh, if a country is not a party to the uh, Rome Statute, where the Security Council can refer the country into the jurisdiction of the um, International Criminal Court. And this has been done twice in recent years, one in the case of Darfur and the other in the case of Libya. Uh, and so we thought that that was the appropriate step to be taken and we recommended that. But to get that done, you require a substantive, not a procedural vote of the Security Council and a substantive vote would require the concurring vote of the five permanent members of the uh, Security Council, uh, the United States, uh, France, the United Kingdom, China and the Russian Federation. And uh, China and the Russian Federation, though making it clear that they didn't uh, question any of our findings, uh, have also made it clear that they didn't agree with country-specific mandates and therefore they didn't uh, agree to any substantive step being taken. Uh, the question that is now presented by the uh, resolution of the Security Council unanimously on the 29th of um, February of this year is whether uh, in the events that have now occurred the um, Security Council would be willing to take uh, a substantive step in respect of referring North Korea to uh, the International Criminal Court. Some people say that is a pipe dream and it may indeed be uh, something that won't happen soon. But the fact 
of the matter is that China is uh, very rare in the use of the veto. Uh, in, the United, in the history of the United Nations, the veto has been used something of the order of 450 times by the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation, about 300 times by the United States of America, about 80 times by the United Kingdom, about 56 times by France, and 11 times by China. So China doesn't do vetoes as part of its normal diplomacy. It tends to like to keep talking about issues, and I'm far from convinced that talking about these issues, the fact that China has now come on board for very strong sanctions, and according to The Economist newspaper is enforcing those sanctions at the border between North Korea and China, uh, I think that indicates that uh, there may be a possibility that uh, some um, uh, outcome of continuous dialogue uh, in the Security Council may produce a result. But if that isn't so, uh, what can we do in the international community to um, follow up the uh, report of the Commission of Inquiry? The most important thing, it seems to me, is to uh, put at rest the view that peace and security is an entirely different issue from the universal human rights. It's not a different issue in the Charter of the United Nations. If you go back to that document of 1945, which I remind you was drawn up essentially by Anglo-American lawyers, the Charter refers in its opening preambles to the purposes of the United Nations. And those purposes are given as to assure international peace and security, uh, the observance of universal human rights, and justice in the world. Now, justice was the signature for anti-colonialism and the end of the colonial empires. Um, international peace and security was the result of the then recent explosion over Hiroshima and Nagasaki of the nuclear weapons and the great urgency of finding a means of ensuring that they were not repeated and that the enormous sacrifices of the Second World War would not be repeated. Uh, and universal human rights uh, was the idea that unless you could ensure respect for the fundamental human rights of human beings, you were not going to get justice, you were not going to get decolonialism, and you were not going to have international peace and security. So how does one uh, express that case. I think you can express it by reference to what happened whilst we were in the midst of preparing our report in December uh, 2013. Uh, we were working in the Palais Wilson in uh, Geneva and we received a sudden message from Korea uh, of uh, an event that had just been reported in North Korea. And this event was the arrest and execution of Jiang Song Tek, uh, who was the uncle of the Supreme Leader. He was the second or third most important person in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And uh, that night on the television, we saw, as you possibly have also seen, the site of Jiang Song Tek being arrested at a meeting of the Politburo. Uh, dragged out of that meeting and forced to do so in a humbled posture and subsequently uh, very quickly placed before a military tribunal uh, where after an extremely speedy trial in which he was uh, screamed at by the judges uh, and uh, called lower than a dog and a traitor, uh, he was executed. The mode of his execution is a matter of controversy, whether it was rockets or whether it was guns, uh, doesn't matter much. He was dispatched very quickly. And there have been further reports of the, re of the um, removal and execution of very senior officials in uh, North Korea. And uh, 
uh, Jiang, uh, the uncle of the supreme leader, had been a very important person after the death of his father, uh, uh, Kim Jong-il, uh, and had been called the, uh, the watchtower. He was the watchtower of uh, the new supreme leader, because presumably because of his youth. This was a very experienced and powerful official who was actually the husband of the daughter of Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea. So he was right at the centre of the Kim dynasty, but perhaps more important for present purposes, he was a person who had very many connections with China. And he, uh, in his uh, speeches, writing and actions, was very keen to get the new leadership in North Korea to take the China path. That is to say, to continue the role of the party, but to change the role of the economy and to open North Korea up to the influences of outside. But uh, he was destroyed. And others who have been seen as challenging uh, Kim Jong-un have likewise been destroyed. In a society where uh, you have a, an extremely large army which is undernourished, uh, as was shown in material that was placed before the COI and is reported in our uh, report, uh, and which uh, has uh, nuclear weapons uh, and missiles, and increasingly is developing submarine technology which can help to deliver these weapons, uh, you also have a, a great deal of unrest uh, of uh, people who are suffering starvation, uh, dying in very large numbers, their bodies collected and placed near the railway stations, uh, and um, also where the leadership is itself turning upon itself. So this is a very dangerous situation. It's in this way that human rights and security are interconnected. If you don't respect the fundamental human rights of the people, then you have a fragile situation at home in which uh, the possibility of uh, unrest, of disturbance, of fear, of retaliation, uh, and of um, uh, steps taken to uh, respond to the dangers uh, is always there. So um, I in terms of the short-term actions that can be taken, I think that involves continuing the work of the special rapporteur and the United Nations now has to appoint a new special rapporteur as Marzuki Darisman has retired. Uh, taking up one of our suggestions which was of a contact group uh, of countries friendly to North Korea so that by this way uh, a means of communication can be had to uh, promote dialogue on the part of North Korea so that it understands the way the international community operates uh, and how it needs to operate to be accepted within the international community. Um, continuing the investigation of what a prosecutor could do and how uh, the testimony that will one day be used uh, to secure accountability can be arranged uh, and uh, continuing uh, the investigation of the great wrongs that are happening in North Korea. All of this uh, requires action, but so does uh, the strong action on the part of the Security Council to impose um, the sanctions which have been voted recently uh, and to uh, ensure that North Korea is left in no doubt that the international community demands that it return to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty because its possession of nuclear weapons is a great danger to itself and to its neighbours and to the uh, ecology of our planet. Uh, so uh, that is where the matter rests at the moment. We were told in recent days that uh, during um, December of last year, the United States opened secret talks with North Korea to explore possibilities uh, of dialogue uh, and 
the path that might lead to uh, some form of acceptance of the unacceptability in the world community, including Russia and China, uh, of nuclear weapons. I think that that is a good step. Uh, I believe that dialogue is essential, but um, equally so is insistence on accountability. And so the message that I would bring this afternoon uh, on the eve of the meeting of Prime Minister Abe, President uh, Park uh, Ghi, uh, uh, Hai, and uh, President Obama in Washington on Thursday of this week is that um, you have to, in dealing with North Korea, you have to be prepared to embrace um, paradoxical thinking. You have to embrace uh, taking steps that appear antagonistic with each other but which involve reaching out because nuclear weapons are too dangerous a risk to just ignore uh, or to react only with harsh uh, and belligerent action. But on the other hand, experience has shown that uh, North Korea uh, reacts best when the international community uh, makes it clear that its stance is unified and strong and based on facts. And the report of the Commission of Inquiry provides us all with the facts. And we can't now say we don't know what is going on in North Korea because the material is now available to us and provides a very, um, a very sound basis on which the international community should operate. So that is my uh, Schwartz uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I'm very proud to have been asked to deliver it at this law school. And now we will have some Q&A so that you can ask some questions uh, and uh, make statements. So thank you very much. Big round of applause. Okay, now, uh, are there any questions or comments? Yes, speak up if you would. What's the question? Uh, sorry, have you ever encountered any North Korean officials in this work? Did you encounter North Korean officials yeah. in the last other time? Well, how do we uh, render North Korean officials accountable? Well, first of all, we started at the top. Uh, and in the, um, when we prepared the report, we had it in draft form by January 2015. And uh, we uh, then sent a copy of it to Kim Jong-un. Uh, we didn't really expect him to respond straight away, but the letter of transmittal is an annexure to the report, and it's worth reading, because in the letter of transmittal, we said to him that under international law, this was a referral to the command principle, under international law, if a person in command of others, uh, who having the power to prevent uh, or sanction others, from uh, crimes against humanity fails to do so, that person uh, may themselves be liable in international law for the crimes. And we sa I said in my letter of transmittal, uh, including, uh, comma, yourself. <laughs> um, and the United Nations didn't like my doing that any more than they liked my having public hearings or having the media present or any of these other innovations. But I told them that it was a basic principle of due process, at least in common law countries, that if you have the responsibility of inquiry and making findings, and if you come to a conclusion that somebody might be uh, liable for a, a very serious offence, they don't get more serious than crimes against humanity then your duty is to put that person on notice that that is your inclination so that before the final report or the final decision of that body, uh, in this case an inquiry, not a prosecution and not a court, but that you give them a chance of 
speaking to you directly and answering what is concerning you. And uh, so that's what we did and uh, he didn't answer. But since our report came out, uh, there was a big change in the conduct of North Korea. At first, they entered into what was called the charm offensive. And they, uh, they spent several months uh, trying to mollify the international community so that the matter would not be referred as we had recommended to the Security Council. Uh, and it was really astonishing to see the things that they did. For example, they agreed for the first time to respond to the Universal Periodic Review, which takes place in the Human Rights Council. They had already gone through one uh, investigation and response and had said, uh, we don't agree with any of the criticism and we're not going to do anything that you recommend. They were the only country in the history of Universal Periodic Review that had responded in that way. But then during the charm offensive, uh, they said, we agree with a number of the recommendations. And uh, for example, one of the recommendations they agreed with was that they should stop public executions of uh, people because we recounted the testimony of uh, school children who had people who, when school children, had been taken to witness uh, executions and how the blood and bones would uh, sh shattered in the execution and would come and spray on them, which they found disgusting and they were rounded up and required to be there. Uh, and uh, North Korea said, well, we'll reconsider that. Uh, so they agreed to a number, though not all of the recommendation, but a large number. This was during the charm offensive. But once uh, the United Nations showed its spine and sent the report to the Security Council, uh, the charm offensive finished at once. The proposal that they should uh, go to Brussels and discuss human rights with the European Union stopped. The proposal that the High Commissioner for Human Rights should be invited to Pyongyang stopped. And other steps that they had taken, the charm was over. Uh, and so what I think that teaches is um, any progress that you're going to make is going to follow very clear um, indication of where you stand on an issue. And then you have to reach out and try to uh, persuade them to take steps uh, which are to, rest to return them to uh, a respect for universal human rights. It's not an easy task at all, uh, but um, military uh, means was never on the agenda of the United Nations and is not, not in contemplation given the enormous risks. And therefore, we have to work on a solution which is both um, clear and definitive, but also one of outreach and engagement, including, I think, by uh, confidential negotiations with them, because their position of nuclear weapons is far too dangerous for uh, themselves, for their region, for uh, the Republic of Korea, which is only a hundred kilometers away from the border of North Korea, uh, and also for Japan, over which the missiles, including a, a missile I understand was, uh, was uh, fired this morning uh, from North Korea. So this is all belligerent action uh, that needs very firm resolve on the international community. And the most important step was the step taken on the 29th of February when the Security Council of the United Nations unanimously took the step of uh, imposing uh, new and very severe sanctions on North Korea in response to its recent steps uh, in, uh, with weapons tests uh, and uh, other um, uh, other new uh, innovations in their uh, weaponry technology. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Right up the back. I'm going to come up there and 
make sure I hear what you have to say. I can talk really loud. Yes, that, you can talk loud. That's good. Uh, so I actually read the report. I didn't get it at an airport, but I concur. It is uh, great reading and uh, amazing work. So my question is, during the process... Six months. Yes. Six months. Not many could have done that in six months. Impressive. Good. Uh, I, I just wanted to extract that. <laughs> I like adjectives. Dur during, the, during the process, did you think about the uh, incentive effect that threats have on the leaders? So the more you threaten them, we're going to call you to the Hague and put you in shackles and do crimes against humanity. Obviously, that one effect that might have is to entrench them even more. Mm -hmm because exit for them is then even more costly. Yes. So I'm wondering how you did that balance of uh, accountability versus giving them incentive effects to sort of even entrench, uh, hang on. Okay, I understand the question, and it's a fair question. Um, of course we thought about that, um, and of course we considered, is there a strategy that we can adopt uh, that will be consistent with our mandate, but which will encourage action. One thing that the Russian ambassador told us, advised us when we called on him, he said, we understand this regime, we've been there, this is a time capsule, this is what we went through, and if they ever do anything that is right or good, acknowledge it and give encouragement. And we did that. For example, they signed on to, but have not yet ratified, the Disabilities Convention. So anything we found that was positive, we acknowledge fully. And as I told you, on genocide, we didn't push the envelope and say, well, now genocide has evolved to a larger meaning uh, of uh, killing a lot of people for political reasons. There, there are theories that say that. And we indicated that we were rather sympathetic to those theories. But where we had a choice, we didn't push the envelope. We, we made a prudent, uh, and cautious uh, series of findings. Uh, and thirdly, um, our job was to be a commission of inquiry in relation to offences against human rights and crimes against humanity. We were neither expert in geopolitics nor were we authorised to negotiate with uh, a country like North Korea. Uh, that properly falls into the uh, responsibilities of the Security Council and of the countries of the United Nations. Uh, and therefore, uh, when uh, our obligations to make our findings were discharged, it really wasn't for us to try to uh, soften the findings or withhold the findings that we'd been asked to make or to make the findings more palatable to North Korea, hoping that they would buy uh, a watered down version of what goes on there. Our duty as a commission of inquiry was to make the truthful findings and report that to the nation states. And then it's for the nation states to take the uh, course of, uh, of uh, saying, well, these are the findings, what do we do with this country? But the one thing we can't say now is we don't know. The nation states know. So they have the, the information. This is a bit like the separation of powers. The, the inquiry did the investigation. It made the findings. We were urged to continue the commission of inquiry. And I said, and my colleagues said, no, no way. We have done our job. We've made the findings. We're not going to continue in office. Uh, and uh, it's now, we wanted to place the responsibility for following up the inquiry where it belonged on the nation states, particularly, if I can say so, the P5 in the Security Council. And uh, I have to tell you that, uh, of course, I'm aware that in this country and also in my own Australia, uh, there are many who are sceptical and critical of the United Nations. But everything we ask to be done in this inquiry was properly done by the United Nations. Every step that we asked and even insisted on against their 
their inclinations, they accept it. And this is a, this is a case, I believe, where the, the charter system has operated exactly as it's expected to operate. The Commission of Inquiry was set up. There were such commissions of inquiry, international commissions of inquiry, uh, in the 1890s, uh, and before the League of Nations. And there were such commissions of inquiry under the League of Nations. And there have been commissions of inquiry under the United Nations. And their role is not to preempt the negotiation with the country concerned. Their role is to make honest, credible and uh, persuasive findings based upon testimony which is available and which can be judged by the international community. So I hope you'll, you'll appreciate that it really wasn't our job to negotiate or to soften the blow of our report. That would have been a dereliction of our duty which was to tell it as it was and then it's up to the nation states to uh, decide what, if anything, they're going to do about it. But as well as that, with crimes against humanity, remember where they came from. They came after the Second World War because of the Holocaust. They came because of the, the horror of what people then saw. And I never thought that in my life as an Australian judge, going and sitting in Seoul, in Tokyo, in London and in Washington DC, I would go through what as a boy I saw General Eisenhower and General Montgomery go through when they reached the prison camps in Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, the horror of the emaciated bodies, the piles of bodies, but that specific matter was the subject of testimony that we had before our inquiry. In the detention camps, the existence of which North Korea denies, but which are proved not only by the testimony we produced and attracted, but also by the very sharp uh, satellite images of the detention camps that are available, uh, were available to the Commission of Inquiry and are available to you and Google Earth, uh, that that prove the existence of what looks awfully like uh, the presence in the exact places where they were said to be of prison, of detention camps. We were told that the job of one of our witnesses was every morning to go around the barracks uh, with a wheelbarrow and pick up the emaciated bodies of detainees who had died overnight. And then his job was to wheel those bodies to a vat, put them in a vat, uh, fire the vat, but the vat didn't have the efficiency of the German ovens uh, and therefore it would reduce the body partly to ashes and partly to legs and arms and then uh, th his job was to take them, wheel them out and put them in the nearby fields as fertiliser. Uh, and as I listened to this testimony, I, nothing came on my mind so vividly as those images of, of Montgomery and Eisenhower at Belsen uh, and Auschwitz and the other uh, prison camps that were opened up after the Second World War and the, the feeling of distaste and shock. And you remember what uh, Eisenhower, to his credit, insisted on doing which was to round up the German population of the nearby towns and take them there to look at what had been done in their name. And this is recorded in the testimony of our inquiry and it is there forever as part of the history of the Korean people and it's really important that we at least as citizens should not say, well, Kim Jong-un is not going to be happy with this and therefore we'll water it down and we'll tell it in a gentle way and hopefully we'll be able to persuade him. That's for others and they can try and do it and that's good, that's okay. But crimes against humanity are very special super crimes and our report had, was duty bound to reveal the testimony and that is exactly what we did. Yes, John. 
You don't have such a loud voice, so I'm going to come up here. And I, if I had a microphone, I'd put it in you. This is Jerry Springer here, but with a very serious issue. I understand your claim that you didn't want to push the envelope on the definition of genocide to say that destruction of a group on the basis of political beliefs would count as genocide. But I want to ask you two questions. The one is, do you think there's a principled case for reforming the definition of genocide to include that? Because some might say it seems artificial. Once you admit religious affiliation or religious belief, then very same logic would carry you to presumed political affiliation or political allegiance. So if, is there a principle case for reforming the law? And the second question is, if you had a reform definition, do you think that would have been a powerful thing in your armory against the North Korean government to get them to act in the way that you would like them to act? Well, people told us this is genocide. If, if a layman asked, you know, all these children uh, dying of malnutrition whilst they build up a huge armament and have a, the fifth largest standing army in the world, uh, and spend their money on these things instead of getting food to their people as they could have got for that money, uh, why is that not deliberate killing of a population or section of the population? So it wouldn't have taken much to persuade us that that was genocide. In lay terms, it's genocide. But we were, we were a body that had to comply with our understanding of the current state of international law. And it's actually interesting, if you go back to the negotiations of the Genocide Convention, I think it's 1948, the, the Cuban delegation to that uh, negotiation, which I assume must have been the Batista government, um, uh, tried to persuade the, um, the negotiators to agree that genocide including, included uh, killing a population or group, part of a population on political grounds. But uh, the United States of America opposed that. I don't quite know why, but they opposed it. They said, stick to uh, ethnicity and religion, which of course was what the Holocaust had been. Uh, and we consulted experts. See, I'm not an expert in, in Holocaust or, or genocide uh, law, but we consulted Professor William Shabas, mm -hmm. who is an expert. And He's written a book in which he said international inquiries should curb their inclination to find genocide on the basis that if they don't find it, then that's a failure of the inquiry because this is the gold uh, standard of international uh, crimes. Uh, and you shouldn't feel that that is so because crimes against humanity are already uh, terribly serious. Into it's not just offences against human rights law. These are super crimes of things that really shock the conscience of humanity and therefore demand accountability. And so after hearing we consulted others, Sir Geoffrey Nice, who was a prosecutor of genocide in the Balkans, and we, we consulted lots of other people, and it's all there in our report. And we said, personally, we were inclined to think that genocide in international common law, the customary law of mankind, has moved on to recognise genocide for political reasons. But we've already got all these crimes against humanity. We don't have to do that and we're not going to do it because we wanted our report to be as tight and strong as we could make it. And we also wanted, in a sense, to be fair to North Korea. They, uh, we actually invited them to be present and we negotiated with the uh, government of ROK, the South Korea, to allow exceptionally a representative to come from North Korea to represent them. They agreed to that, which is to their credit. Uh, or we said you can, uh, you can brief lawyers in South Korea to represent you and we will accept them. And they didn't do any of these things. Uh, so we were trying to be fair to them and the best way we, can, we could produce a rigorous report that was convincing was not to push the envelope, to just do it within the limits of the law as it stood and that would be the more powerful because we hadn't done that, we hadn't pushed. But in fact, back in Australia when I rushed to catch my plane to come to Chicago, I was in the middle of a paper for Professor Colin Tatz who writes on genocide studies 
on just this issue, has genocide moved on? And I think with you that it has moved on. Cambodia, take Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge didn't kill people because of their race, they were all Khmer. And they didn't kill them because of their religion, because they were Buddhists um, or Catholics, uh, but they killed them because they were regarded as unreliable politically. It was a political, it was the same as North Korea, and to some extent a similar type of organisation of society. So um, the answer to your question is, we did think that it should advance. Uh, we explained why we didn't do it in our report, and I think we took the right steps in the report, given the current state of indisputable international law on this subject. Yes, excuse me, I'll just... Sorry. Putin and Lavrov have said uh, one reason for their support of Assad is to establish a norm against coercive regime change. And uh, the United States, in imposing sanctions on Iran, has specifically, or the Obama administration, has specifically sought to avoid sanctions that would have the effect of destabilizing the regime. So I wonder, in defining crimes against humanity, there is an opposite kind of valence that's possible to uh, find criteria that put a regime beyond the pale of that kind of legal protection so that the effect of sanctions would not simply be a punishment that has no real effect, but that would actually coerce and force a reform or change of the regime. And then is it possible that there are some normative ideas that the United States and China could agree on uh, toward implementing sanctions that would actually compel the regime to change? Yeah, well, that, that's a, a very good question. I, in terms of regime change, I'm sure you'll understand that we, as officers of the United Nations, working in the House of the United Nations, of which North Korea is a member. See, we weren't in the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis another member state or another state. We were actually working for the United Nations and it therefore really wasn't open to us to say, well, this is hopeless, the only solution here is regime change. We might, shall we say, occasionally have thought that in our private thoughts, but it wasn't open to us as officers of the United Nations to say a member state has to have a regime change. Anyway, in a way, that would be a presumption on our part because the change belongs in international law to the people. I mean, this is like a self-determination of a people after a colonial uh, post-war um, imposition. Never forget the people of Korea did not choose to be divided. That was imposed upon them by the uh, successful allies. They discussed it in Cairo and they decided that after the war there would be a division of influence, uh, areas of influence. There was talk of whether it would be a mandate and then eventually they said no, just a division of uh, areas of influence and it was actually Dean Rusk who drew the line in the State Department that became the border between North and South Korea. That was done by us in a way, not by the people of Korea. Now, uh, in terms of the, uh, the um, changes and getting changes, uh, a study of the closing area, uh, the closing months, closing year of the Second World War indicates that even the Nazis began to get cold feet. And there's the famous story, as you may know, of the delegation of the International Committee of the Red Cross, which was permitted by Heinrich Himmler to go to Theresienstadt. And Himmler, in his own contorted way, was endeavouring, while still remaining loyal to Hitler, to open avenues of dialogue with the Allies 
and for the first time they permitted the Red Cross to go to Theresienstadt. And we all now know they put on a show. They had a soccer match, they had a play, they had recitals, and they took away a bus with, I think, about 15 Danish Jews. That was the deal. But the deal was required of the inquiry that they walk along a red line and did not talk to the prisoners, but simply uh, attended these things and took away uh, the Danish Jews back to Denmark, where they survived the war. Just imagine being in Theresienstadt and seeing this little group with their tiny suitcases going onto the bus to be taken out of that uh, transition camp between other camps and Auschwitz. My partner, Johan, in Australia, uh, grew up in the Netherlands under the occupation. And he said to me, don't you walk a red line. And we didn't. We told the truth. Politicians can walk red lines. They can negotiate. But uh, this, this is a really, really horrible situation and it has to change. North Korea didn't have to become a member of the United Nations. It's not obligatory. It could have stayed out and acted as it, it, it wants to do. But if it joins the United Nations, it has to comply with the Charter, which talks of international peace and security, universal human rights and justice. And uh, it signed, strangely, uh, most of the big United Nations human rights treaties. And if it does that, it has to comply with them and has to be accountable for them. And that's basically all we did. Uh, and so as to the wider questions of regime change, I don't want to get into the Iran uh, issue, but I, I do think there has been some progress on Iran and we should, take, we should take encouragement. These are very difficult negotiations. And the most important imperative, if you are my age, if you are my age, you grew up under the shadow of the mushroom cloud and after the Second World War, you were never sure that we were going to survive. I mean, that is the truth of the matter. Down there in Australia, uh, we all had this image of the mushroom cloud. Now, the current generation has lost that, but that is still with us and that is still terribly dangerous. And we, we really have to take the situation of a country with these human rights abuses um, very seriously because the nuclear weapons that they now possess is, is very dangerous to themselves but also to others. Yes? Uh, Division of Korea. Um, was it Dean Rusk or Dean Atchison? No, it was Rusk, Rusk. I gather. He was a middle level. R Atchison was the <laughs> Secretary of State, yes. so he wouldn't dirty his hands with any. Right. Okay. But Dean Rusk was a middle level official in the State Department. Okay and it fell to him and he didn't know anything about the Korean Peninsula and he said I just struck a line with some contouring of uh, topography through the middle of uh, and if you look at it uh, it started out almost exactly in the middle and it ended up after the Korean War just about exactly the middle of the Korean Peninsula but it's very important to remember that it wasn't the choice of the Korean people and there was a very vivid story uh, of a football match. In the Asian Games, uh, ironically, the two finalists uh, to win the medals for the top football team were DPRK and ROK, North Korea and South Korea. This was about two years ago and the Games were held in Incheon in the Republic of Korea, which itself is a very ironic thing. And so the team from North Korea and their sports people came down and they played the game. And whenever a player from uh, South Korea fell over, the North Korean players picked him up. And whenever a player from North Korea fell over, the South Koreans picked him up. 
and uh, throughout the game the audience cried out, we are one. So I think outsiders, it's, it's as if in the American Civil War you had been divided by some powerful international force, if, if maybe Britain had tried at that time to say, well, that's just divided, you're not going to fight anymore, we're going to stop it. A and then you felt one, but you couldn't find a way, a path to be one. And one side was, was modern, a, a successful economy, progressive, uh, basically open, democratic, and the other side was unfair, unjust, and often starving, but had very powerful weapons. I mean, it's as if that had happened in your case. And I think we have to remember that the Korean people are really, to some extent, innocent of this. And what has happened is, is really um, a, a most unfortunate historical uh, accident. But it's there and it's dangerous. And we therefore have to have the truth and the facts. And then we have to decide what we do and how can we move in, in dialogue uh, towards uh, a peaceful resolution of this. Okay, one, another question from Professor Ginsberg, and then I think you've all had enough. <laughs> or I've had enough. <laughs> Wait till you hear my question. <laughs> I wanted to uh, pick up on this theme. Um, it's, it, in, in a way, it seems like the core, of the, the core of the dilemma, you didn't talk much about the nuclear side, the human rights side we, we've heard a lot about and it's obviously a, a very passionate and horrific set of circumstances. In a way, the dilemma arises because of the nuclear side and there can't be any uh, humanitarian intervention or any of the other things that might be considered in a country without nuclear weapons. And I wanted to know, um, in a way, if, if you have come up with any thoughts on how the rest of the world and even South Korea can credibly commit to the northern regime that we don't want regime change. And the reason they have the nuclear weapons is because all they care about is their own political survival. Unification under the South's terms would disturb that. Humanitarian intervention would disturb that. How can in a world where we are increasingly seeing uh, desire to intervene, responsibility to protect these doctrines, how can we credibly say to them, no, you can keep your regime? Well, uh, I don't think that's going to happen because you know that, that the Constitution of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea claims that it is the legitimate government of the whole of the peninsula. And the Constitution of the Republic of Korea claims that it is the democratic uh, government of the whole of the peninsula. And in fact, in the Republic of Korea, I understand they have governors for the lost provinces that are in the north who are solemnly appointed by the President of the Republic of Korea, and, but they're not in office. Um, presumably they're waiting for an opportunity. So uh, I don't think there's any possibility um, that even if we had suggested it, which would have been excessive to our mandate, that um, that would be taken seriously. Um, but there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed along the lines of various contingencies. Don't forget that the uh, end of the division between uh, the two Germanys didn't happen by careful planning and by careful dialogue and ultimate acceptance and uh, this will be a good thing for all of us. That didn't happen at all. Some mistakes happened. Mistakes occurred, and then there had to be very swift action, very swift action. And so uh, I think um, the likely trajectory is not going to be great gestures from South Korea uh, or from North Korea. I think it's going to be just seeing how the coming years of the current regime play out. Of course, um, uh, Kim Jong-un has seen the documentary 
of the fall and execution of the Ceausescus. And he's seen the documentaries of the um, way Saddam Hussein ended up in a ditch and the way um, Gaddafi ended up in a pipe. And so um, looked at from the point of view of reg regime preservation, uh, the strategy that he has adopted is not an irrational strategy. Uh, but the problem that it presents for the world in human rights terms is that it's a very dangerous strategy because the danger is not only a war being caused by uh, North Korea or South Korea or anyone else. The danger is an accident or a mistake or somebody who's fed up with the, the tension of living in a situation where he or she might be blasted to pieces by a rocket. Uh, and these, therefore, are the dangers for which diplomats have to prepare. But a commission of inquiry has to find the facts, and that's what we did. That was a limited job, but an important job. And it was well executed in a readable report. And if anybody is here, a person from a large publishing enterprise <laughs> who would be prepared to reproduce the report put a, a few very nice photographs of the chairman of the Commission of Inquiry <laughs> and other photographs uh, in the uh, report and put it in an uh, O'Hare airport and other airports near you, uh, that would be a very good thing because the people of the world deserve to know what the source of the risk is and uh, ensure that we respond to it rationally, carefully, prudently but remembering the duty of accountability for crimes against humanity.